Welcome back to Ox Tools. I'm Tom. Um, we're getting ready to start a project, uh, a little different project. Um, a couple of days ago, I was uh, um, I wanted to use this little hydraulic jack here, and this is just a little cheapy, uh, you know, Walmart or I don't know where Harbor Freight or something, a uh, uh, little two-ton bottle jack here. Um, you know, you can buy these for literally nine or ten bucks uh, if you shop around a little bit. Um, well, I don't know, a couple of months ago I helped a friend move a, a pretty heavy duty milling machine, uh, much bigger than a bridge port, uh, about 3,500 pound machine. Anyway, we were using uh, pry bars and, uh, and wood wedges and things like that and the pallet jack to move it. I wrote an article about it, it's on the uh, Ox Tool blog if you want to check it out. Anyway, uh, I started thinking about uh, uh, hydraulic toe jacks. And uh, for those of you that don't know what a toe jack is, it's got a little finger or a little toe uh, that's very, very close to the ground. And uh, so if you lift something up, you can slip it under and because it projects outward um, and then start lifting with that. So here's a, a larger example. This is a uh, an old uh, mechanical jack that somebody gave me a long time ago. Um, and this kind of works the same way. And this is the this is the toe here. So this is a mechanical version of the same thing. Now this one here, I don't have a tape measure on me, but uh, you got to come up an inch and a half or an inch and a quarter here to get this thing in there, which isn't very much, which is great, you know. Um, the only drag with this one here is um, you got to have a, a fairly long bar in it. And a lot of times when you're moving machinery, let me get this out of the way here, when you're moving machinery, this long bar, you know, it's up against the wall or another machine or it's just inconvenient. And uh, uh, it works fine. This is a five, uh, five ton jack, I think, and it's a Buddha um, made in Harvey, Illinois. Uh, works pretty good and uh, got this cool little cast in handle. Um, anyway, uh, um, so that sticking that lever in there is kind of inconvenient. So, what I want to do is make this into a hydraulic toe jack. Now, they sell these things, you can buy them, but for whatever reason, they're like incredibly expensive. And our, uh, uh, our friends at Harbor Fright. Um, haven't uh, got onto that one yet. Uh, I've been waiting for, for years for them to, to pick up on that and, and offer a, a cheap version of it because you don't use them very often, you know, unless you're a, a professional rigger or something like that. Um, anyway, they haven't done it yet. So, sure, you can buy bottle jacks, you can buy floor jacks, you can buy porta powers, you can buy everything but a frickin' toe jack. So, we're gonna make one. That's what we're gonna do. So, Anyway, uh, I got to thinking about it. I had to repair this jack here. It has a little threaded foot in the, in the tip. And um, I went to use it and I picked it up by the little threaded tip and it came out of there. And I was like, oh shit, okay. Um, so I said, okay, well I'll fix it. And uh, so I machined a little, um, a little threaded bushing and uh, I put it into the end of the, uh, of the hydraulic ram here. And then I used uh, silicon bronze to weld it in there. And I was very careful, I extended this up. Uh, I didn't want to injure the seals, right? So I extended this up and put some, uh, some cool rags around here and just kind of backstep welded around that and let it cool off in between and, uh, so that this thing didn't get hot and wreck the seal. Um, and it seems to have worked fine. Now, in the commercial toe jacks, they, uh, they actually build them from scratch that way. Uh, and they weld something to the, uh, the cylinder body here. It's the guide for the, uh, for the toe part. Anyway, we're going to do it a little differently uh, since we, uh, we don't want to do that because it'll distort this tube and uh, you know, the jack will leak like a sieve or won't even work. So I did some, uh, some design work and, uh, and we'll bring you in closer to look at that. And this is a general layout and some dimensional stuff for, uh, for the little bits and pieces uh, for this. So we're gonna get started and um, 
uh, cut up some material and uh, square up a bunch of stuff and drill some holes and uh, and put this all together and uh, then we'll find something heavy to pick up with it and uh, go from there. So anyway, uh, I'll be back in a sec. Uh, we'll start cutting some stuff and uh, go from there. Thanks. Okay, here's the uh, here's the general layout of this thing and. Um, Let's see, let me go around the other side here so I don't put a shadow on this thing. Um, so here's the general layout. This is the top view here, and this is the, the cylindrical part of the jack, and, uh, and this is the toe here projecting out. Um, so all this sits on a base plate here, um, and uh, this will uh, get the, the base of this jack will get attached to the base plate. Um, so now, I mentioned that uh, uh, we don't want to do any welding to the uh, to the jack and distort it and make the uh, hydraulic cylinder leak. So the way we're going to attach the uh, the guideways is we're going to use a split clamp, uh, a pair of split clamps um, that's going to uh, sandwich around the uh, uh, the cylindrical part of the uh, of the uh, hydraulic jack and uh, and clamp it in position and. Um, then there'll be a uh, there's a the the moving part here. This is the part that goes that'll go up and down on the uh, on the toe jack. This is a fixed part and it has a guide key that's that'll be made out of bronze. I'll show the materials in a second. Um, so I, I wouldn't. It, this is kind of for my construction purposes here. I've worked out some of the dimensions and some of the the things that are uh, kind of difficult to work out in the shop. Uh, and think about and you know so we do a, a, a general layout here and then I pulled uh, some parts off and uh, dimension those so we can make those um, so I'll show you the materials in a second and then uh, I'm gonna cut a bunch of stuff up and then there's some squaring and prep work and uh, and then we'll do some machining okay um, so I'll show you some materials here actually I just noticed something I was showing you guys a drawing a second ago and uh, I looked on the table here, and uh, this is where I first started thinking about it. And I do this a, a lot as I draw on the table, um, kind of like a blackboard, you know, and uh, uh, where I start thinking about stuff, and then uh, I'll take it to the computer and, uh, and tune it up a little bit and get some real numbers. So uh, here's, the, here's the jack that we're going to be screwing around with, and then there you can see the... Uh, uh, the bushing I put in there and put in there with silicon bronze and you can see the heat marks has come down a little ways there and uh, and uh, that worked out all right um, so I don't know I've had this thing for a while and uh, I have several of them and uh, I if I'm gonna make this uh, um, you know two ton that's a that's a pretty good capacity um, but what was more important to me was that it be compact um, so this is the jack we're gonna use um, Here's some of the materials. It's not going to take a lot of stuff here. So um, I've got some uh, half by two uh, cold rolled here. It's just, you know, standard flat bar. I went down to my uh, favorite steel supplier, uh, Nailers, um, down in Hayward. And, um, and I bought a, a length of a uh, cold rolled flat bar. And um, I had this uh, half by three here. That's going to be the uh, the clamps that go around the uh, the body of this, and um, and then nailers uh, they kind of pre-cut some stuff. Um, you know they have it in in inventory. You know, and this is a, a ten by ten by half inch thick plate, and I don't know, it was twelve bucks or something like that, and it's already cut to size. I don't have to buy a gigantic sheet or whatever right um, I wasn't sure what size the base plate was going to end up being so I, I just got one that I knew was going to be big enough and then uh, this is some bronze uh, uh, this is quarter by one I believe right now and oh no quarter by seven eighths that's kind of a weird size um, and s scraping it I think this is uh, uh, 932 bronze is what it feels like and it's uh, it's it's uh, it doesn't have the the gold, the deeper gold color of uh, 954, um, and and it's softer than 954. So I'm not sure what bronze alloy this is, but I think it's 932. Um, anyway, uh, so that's the that's the you know that's, that's 
That's it. And then there's going to be some fasteners, and uh, and that's and uh, that's about it. So it's a pretty simple project, I think. And uh, we'll see how it comes out, and uh, we'll test it on something. All right. So we're going to start some uh, some layout here. Um, I don't have a fancy uh, plasma cutter or anything like that and uh, so I'm going to use the vertical bandsaw and do most of this work on that and you'll see that it's actually pretty quick and, uh, and pretty efficient cutting. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and start with the base plate here and um, pull some dimensions off of that. Um, the first thing I want to do is select a kind of a, a reasonable edge here that's not too, uh, too chowdered up. And uh, yeah, it's got a little bend to it. We'll probably do a little straightening on this plate. Um, I'm going to go with this edge for my base, baseline anyway. And I'll just mark that so I remember where I started from. So um, what I'll do is uh, um, I'm going to take a little trim cut off of that because when they shear this, it's got a little edge that's compressed and uh, it's distorted. And I want this to be, you know, uniform flat material. So I'm going to take a little, uh, a little skiz off of that and uh, um, get rid of that, uh, that sheared edge there. And this is a carbide tip scriber here. And now I got a good, nice straight line there that'll, that'll be my baseline, okay? Um, so the long way is seven and a half, and then what I'm going to do is, I, what I, when I set off the dimension, I don't really care what this little offset is here. Um, I'm going to sight to my uh, my scribe line there, okay, and align the seven and a half there, and just kind of ignore the uh, um, this raw edge here. Although I'm still using it as a guide, if that makes sense. So. Do the same thing over here, and uh, get away from that uh, that uh, that squanked up edge there. Okay. Okay. Now here I want to be a little bit careful because that's my other dimension here, five inches, um, to make sure that I end up kind of uh, um, parallel, or yeah, that it's parallel. So I'm probably going to go a little farther, that way it'll allow me to kind of clean it up a little bit. I'll probably clean it up on the middle, my whisker here. Actually, you know what? No, screw that. It's a jack, okay? It's not a, it's not a frickin' uh, um, you know, precision machine deal. It's a toe jack. It's going to get jacked up, <laughs> literally. <laughs> so let's get real here, right? It's a fab job. It's not a heavy-duty machining job. Okay, so this edge is pretty square anyway. So I set off five inches off of that uh, in, in two places, one place here, one place there. And then when I put the square on here and put it up there, they actually lined up. So it's actually pretty square. So uh, now, I don't know if any of you guys out there have checked these. This is a Sterrett combination square forged head. Um, I've checked these uh, um, with a cylindrical square and a, uh, and a comparator um, and they're, they are really good. Over 12 inches my square was less than uh, two thousandths. Uh, um, it was within two thousandths of being square which is pretty good uh, for you know a combination square. So you can do some pretty good work with these if you uh, um, if you're careful with them. Okay, so we'll do the dumbbell check, make sure I did it right. Five inches by seven and a half. Yes, yes, okay, I'm good. All right, so that's that. We'll go, excuse me, do that on the, uh, on the vertical bandsaw. Uh, now we gotta, we're gonna blank off a couple pieces off of this. And um, they're gonna be about two inches by three inches. Okay. 
And uh, these I'm going to cut long just because uh, um, there's some uh, other work to do on them or other machine work. Okay, so it's two and a sixteenth. And then we'll go four, um, oops, four and an eighth for the next one. Okay, so there's two of those. Oop. All right. Um, then, far, let's see. Uh, six and a half. And I'm going to cut that one a little long, too. So, I got a scribe line there, so what I do with the scribe is I come up to it and I feel the scribe drop into it, then bring the square blade up to it like that, and then do my scribe. Okay, so I need one of those. And, uh, and then what I'm going to do, I'm going to flip it around, that way I don't have to think about the curve. And this other one's seven and an eighth, plus a little bit. Mark, catch, catch the scribe, slide up. Okay. This is a reminder for me so I don't screw up. All right, we'll go over to the saw and do some cutting. Okay, so over here on the vertical band saw, and uh, we're gonna buzz through that. One of the, uh, one of the, somebody made a comment on uh, one of the videos and they said, hey, get in a little closer to the action. So um, this is me experimenting, uh, getting in closer and trying not to wreck my dang camera. Um, so let me know what you guys think. Uh, I'm trying to get in a little closer. Uh, um, you don't get to see my lovely face, but uh, um, you get to, to see the action here. So uh, this is a half inch wide bimetal blade. Uh, I think it's a uh, um, six tooth per inch, something like that. Um, and you'll see that it'll walk right through this stuff uh, um, and we'll make short work of this deal here. see that you know it goes pretty quick and uh, there's the cut um, you know it's a nice cut flip it around do the other one so this piece of wood here you see is a belly board I just kind of lean on it with my chest to get some feet pressure going
Okay, so over here in the mill, um, so we got all our, uh, our rough sawn components here. Um, most of the, once again, this isn't a precision project here. This is a, uh, it's a toe jack. So we got to keep that in perspective. So, but it's helpful to have the ends cleaned up and uh, if you're going to do it, you might as well do it to length. Uh, I don't need to hit a thow or anything like that, but uh, um, uh, we certainly want nice square edges and uh, things like that to work with. It's just helpful later on. So um, um, instead of just, you know, starting on one part and just kind of working my way through, um, I'm going to do all the kind of squaring operations and, uh, and blank preparation is what I call it um, first, which is usually a, the most efficient way to go on stuff um, unless there's widely varying um, uh, sizes and whatnot. All these uh, comfortably fit in the, uh, in the Kurt Vice, so uh, uh, we'll make short work of, uh, of squaring it all up and, uh, and making the edges nice and um, then we'll get to the more detailed machine work. Alright, so we'll start with our first pieces here and uh, get the drill chuck out. So that's got a 5 8 shank and I'm going to throw that with a 5 8 shank in it to save myself a collet change. It's always a, a nice thing. This is a five flute carbide end mill. That 1200 RPM there. So that was a climb mill dry. Um, I don't know how well you can see that, but uh, it's uh, it's a pretty nice finish. Okay. Better than that, I found a, uh, a spiral uh, uh, flute tap, and uh, it's factory ground off, and it's plugged, so it's only got one and a half threads or so on that. And this, the chips will come out of this blind hole, um, so this is a better tap for this uh, this job here. Oop, that's a little. I think I'm gonna go slow here. 
So I know how deep I drilled the hole, so I'm just going to kind of register that at the surface like that. Come back over the hole. Oops. Get back on center there, Tom. Okay, so that should uh, be my uh, my hole. So now um, what I want to do is uh, I want to watch the depth uh, on my uh, my little quill readout. So when I'm getting close to the bottom of the hole, I want to I want to reverse. I'm going to reverse at about 425, I think, is uh, where I want to reverse. that. You see the chips come out of the hole there so that's kind of a, a nice little tap there. Yeah, it looks pretty good. Close to the bottom. Now that 425 uh, was just kind of a guess based on the because uh, um, I zeroed with the, the drill point, right? So there's a little bit of this, the drill angle there that I have to deal with. So I just, um, so I drilled in half inch. So I took um, 75 thousandths off for uh, um, the drill point uh, for a full hole. And this has got a little, a little bevel on it too. So I get a little more there. Like I said, it was just a guess, you know, kind of experience. Uh, um, And yes, this is a blind hole. Uh, I think you guys knew that though. Um, some people are, you know, I got this, this clamped in the chuck here. Uh, um, you know, some people are nervous about um, power tapping uh, blind holes like this. But on a good size tap like this, um, you know, I don't have it uh, like super, super tight in these chucks. And typically the the tap will slip in the chuck before you break it. Um, doesn't always happen. Every once in a while I break a tap, just like everybody else. And, um, uh, but if you take some basic precautions, then uh, you'll be okay. And you'll save a lot of time. Uh, you know, if you sit there and get the tap wrench out and kind of do that by hand, you know, we'd still be working on that first hole. So I got four holes done, and so I'm done tapping those. Okay, we're back this morning. Um, we're working on the, uh, the squaring up these blocks for the, uh, the little toe jack project. Um, what I wanted to show just quickly was uh, a setup that makes it a little easier for uh, to take measurements and um, you know quickly uh, while you're working in the vise uh, and you have a uh, pieces that uh, that have a you know large variation in length. Um, so what we're going to do is we'll put some normal parallels in, and then uh, what I want to do is put the spring in here to uh, kind of separate the parallels and keep them from moving around while I'm swapping parts on. And this is just a spacer block to keep these nice and tight here. But I'm using some fairly tall parallels here and you'll see that uh, when I snug this down, this is above the surface of the vise. Now all I'm doing is clearing off the ends of these. I've already done one end, uh, so now we're going to go for dimension here. Um, but uh, when the um, when the part's above the surface of the vise, um, it, it makes it easy to, to get a measurement. You can see that this just drops right in and I can take a quick measurement there. When it's below the surface of the vise, I have to come in at an angle like this, and which is okay, you know, it works. Um, uh, but this is nice because it kind of like lay, the calipers lay on there and uh, you get this nice broad contact. So. Uh, um, anyway, we're, that's how we're going to do these, <clears throat> and uh, I'm not going to set a stop because I'm going to show you something else with the uh, with the uh, the DRO, 
that uh, is kind of a nice uh, um, thing that people don't don't really do. Well, they do, but maybe not as much as they should. So, um, get those out of the way. So once again, we're just uh, uh, clearing the ends off here, and uh, let's go ahead and take a skim cut on this. And all I'm looking for is a, you know, a 90% cleanup on this, and then I'll take a measurement. One more. Okay. So I got a 90% cleanup on that, and uh, it's enough to come in here and uh, and take a dimension. And I got two inch nine twenty three. Okay. Now what I'm going to do, and I'm not going to refocus the camera, is I'm going to go ahead and plug that number right into the uh, the DRO on the x axis. So I'm going to say two point um, nine two three, and then I have a preset button. And now I'm using the DRO like a measuring tool, which is what it is. And, uh, but, uh, now, before I get carried away here, I can't remember how long this one's supposed to be. I think it's two and, uh, two and seven eighths. This one will be two and seven eighths long. So we're pretty close. But I can read my number directly on the DRO now, and, um, which is kind of a nice thing. I don't have to, uh, to use the calipers all the time, you know, for what we're doing here. Um, it's fine. It's 75. Oops. Okay, so let's see how that did. Okay, so that's a quick way to uh, use your DRO as a measuring tool so I don't have to keep going in there and uh, uh, doing math and uh, or figuring the offset for the cutter or, or whatever and I don't really care that I don't have a, um, that I don't have a stop because all these pieces are all these different lengths so it just messes with your setup so we'll do that again So two inch five thirty eight, two point five three eight preset. Boom, done. Okay. And this one's supposed to be supposed to be two and a half. Now, you know that's an easy one, but if you have a if you have a lot to take off, uh, um, you know you'd be wanting to measure it regularly. So. So somebody was asking about. Um, they were uh, concerned that I was uh, that I was climb climb milling um, on a manual machine, and uh, you know people get into trouble with this uh, from time to time. It just depends what you're doing. Um, the uh, if you notice, this has a lot of food. This is a five fluid end mill here. So and it's spinning pretty fast, and I'm taking fairly light cuts. But the chip load per tooth is fairly low, so um, I can kind of get away with climb cutting on a, a manual machine uh, without too much trouble. Now, if this was a two flute end mill, and it'd be spinning a lot slower, and I'd be lumping around, dump, 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 and um, so the chances of, of snagging and, uh, and having a mishap in climb milling are, are higher. Um, so with a tool change like that, you can, um, um, you know, kind of safely do uh, some uh, a little bit of climb milling on a manual machine, and um, and not have any worries. And you get nicer finishes. It uses less power. <clears throat> it's easier to turn the handle. I mean, there's 
there's advantages. Six inch, five fifty-seven. Six point five five seven. All right, five five seven. Is that good? Five five seven. Yeah. And that was probably supposed to be six and a half. Is that right? Six and a half. Yeah. So, you know, I was talking about the climb milling. So, you know, when I learned, uh, uh, the guy that I learned from, he always said that, well, if you never push the envelope, you never know where the edge of the envelope is, right? And uh, so, nobody wants anything to fly out of the mill or out of the lathe or whatnot, but uh, um, if you experiment and see how hard you can push things and uh, and how big of a cut you can take and you know you do some of that type of experimentation you find out that uh, many times you're nowhere near the edge and um, um, you know sometimes it doesn't matter you know we're just trimming off you know forty thousands or something here right you don't have to take it all in one whack but if you have lots of metal removal or um, lots of roughing to do or whatnot um, it's important to know where the limits of your tooling are and your work holding and things like that. Now, you don't want to flip a, uh, you know, two-ton rotor out of a out of a lathe or something like that, so you're going to be fairly conservative uh, in those situations, but uh, where you have good work holding and, uh, and good tooling and whatnot, um, these machines are pretty amazing uh, what they can do um, if you'll let them. Um, you know, and for hobby guys and uh, and um, risky work or uh, expensive work or whatnot, yes, you're going to be very conservative and you're going to nibble away at these things very carefully uh, um, and not risk uh, chucking them out of the machine or uh, uh, or climb milling and having the thing snag and uh, and do something uh, unpleasant. <laughs> we'll just call it that unpleasant. Um, so. Let's see these guys here. Yeah, I'm just gonna go ahead and I got the tool in. I'm not gonna I'll just open this up a little bit and do these sideways. I was thinking about doing them this way, you know, with the uh, the end of the tool, but I think I'll just do them sideways like this. Get them up close to the uh, the edge like that. All right, so we're gonna plow this groove now. Um, Let's see, do I want to do that? Yeah, light sliding's okay, so. With a five flute end mill like this, you don't want to do uh, deep slotting uh, with it, but this slot's pretty shallow, and uh, so uh, I can go ahead and do it. Got to keep the chips out of there. There's just not as much room for chips. And if the sidewall of the groove that I was milling was deep, then uh, um, there's really, uh, it makes trouble uh, with recutting chips and uh, 
that kind of stuff down in the slot. I'm just checking the width there. Um, it has to clear three quarter, and that's three quarter wide. So um, doesn't have to be a tight fit because I have a long length of engagement. So I want it to go in there easily, and that that goes in there easily. So. And I got my depth already. Okay. All right, so that's the, uh, this is the moving part here. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. So this bit gets uh, welded on like that, and that's the toe. And, uh, the upper is what, two and seven eighths, that's the one? Yeah. And then this connects to the jack here, and that's our toe. Now I may put some side bracing on it, we'll see how it behaves once uh, once we get it going. Um, I think I'm going to put some, because uh, now's the time to do it. Um, the, um, you know, I want to roughen this up a little bit, give it a little bit of texture or tooth. Um, so that, uh, you know, it's just grippier. It's got some tread on it. Uh, smooth like this is probably kind of suboptimal. So what I'm thinking is um, um, I'll cut a series of grooves in there. I'll, I'll uh, run a roughing end mill across that or something like that that leaves a little pattern in that and uh, gives, us some, uh, gives us some traction. All right, here we're going to clamp... Um, Tap two holes in the uh, um, in these clamp uh, the split clamps. Sharpies getting a little dry. And these are just quarter twenty here. Nothing fancy. And about eight hundred RPM there. 
deal. Now, this part's symmetrical, so I can just flip it around like that instead of uh, um, moving the, uh, the mill, which saves a little bit of putzing around there. Works good on small parts, you know, or uh, parts that uh, don't have any weird registration uh, issues. Uh, I'm just drilling a half inch deep, you know, 13 millimeters, something like that. I thought I felt a chip in there. Um, you know, you can. I've talked about it before, but your your senses are pretty good, right? So you can your body can detect, uh, or your your senses can detect small changes, right? And when I clamped that, uh, I uh, it felt soft, like there was something squishy being clamped in the vise. At least that's what I thought. And uh, so sometimes that means there's a there's a chip caught in there or something like that, and you're compressing on the chip, so you can actually feel that. You know, when I slide up against here, I I expect to feel kind of a crisp clack when I touch the stop, and if I feel a kind of a dull, excuse me, um, a dull little blurp, you know, or thump or whatever, uh, then there might be a chip there. So it just kind of clues me in to take a quick look and. Uh, um, so trust your senses, you know, they, uh, they're alerting you to anomalies if you'll pay attention to them. You know, sometimes it's hard to pay attention to them or you're concentrating on something else, uh, like filming, <laughs> um, which happens to me all the time when I'm doing these videos is, uh, uh, I'm thinking about talking and, uh, See, now I just did it, right? I, I got all my holes. So now I want to uh, I want to tap them. But I'm sitting there yammering away, right? And uh, I kind of forgot what I was doing there. So a different tap that's got the the point ground off of it and better than that I found a, uh, a spiral uh, uh, flute tap and uh, it's factory ground off and it's plugged so it's only got one and a half threads or so on that and this the chips will come out of this blind hole um, so this is a better tap for this uh, this job here Oop, that's a little I think I'm gonna go slow here. So I know how deep I drilled the hole, so I'm just gonna kind of register that at the surface, like that. Come back over the hole. Oops. Get back on center there, Tom. Okay, so that should uh, 
be my uh, my hole. So now um, what I want to do is uh, I want to watch the depth uh, on my uh, my little quill readout. So when I'm getting close to the bottom of the hole, I want to I want to reverse. I'm going to reverse at about 425. I think is uh, where I want to reverse. that. You see the chips come out of the hole there, so that's kind of a, a nice little tap there. Yeah, looks pretty good. Close to the bottom. Now that 425 uh, was just kind of a guess based on the... because uh, um, I zeroed with the, the drill point, right? So there's a little bit of this, the drill angle there that I have to deal with. So I just, um, so I drilled in half inch. So I took um, 75 thousandths off for uh, um, the drill point uh, for a full hole. And this has got a little, a little bevel on it too. So I get a little more there. Like I said, it was just a guess, you know, kind of experience. Uh, um, And yes, this is a blind hole. Uh, I think you guys knew that, though. Um, some people are, you know, I got this just clamped in the chuck here. Uh, um, you know, some people are nervous about um, power tapping uh, blind holes like this. But on a good size tap like this, um, you know, I don't have it uh, like super, super tight in these chucks, and typically the the tap will slip in the chuck before you break it. Um, doesn't always happen. Every once in a while, I break a tap, just like everybody else. And um, uh, but if you take some basic precautions, then uh, you'll be okay. And you'll save a lot of time. Uh, you know, if you sit there and get the tap wrench out and kind of do that by hand, you know, we'd still be working on that first hole. So I got four holes done, and so I'm done tapping those. Okay, so um, we're gonna do the uh, the mating pieces. These are the mating pieces for these uh, the clamps. So uh, we're gonna do those now, but. These are only half inch wide here, and um, so I got to go through. I got to counterbore through, and one thing uh, sometimes happens: uh, people forget, um, you know, about the drill that's going to project through, right, and the clearance around the parallel. So sometimes you look at the the, the shop parallels, and they're all chowdered up because. Uh, um, you know, a lot of times you're not thinking about what's below uh, what you're working on there. So, um, anyway, it's, I don't know, I guess I call it situational awareness. You know, what am I drilling into? What am I going through? What's underneath? Uh, you know, am I going to drill into the vise or what, you know? So, um, you really kind of develop some of these senses. Uh, the lathe is a good one for that because you're typically looking at the tool tip and uh, um, there's all these other things that come up close to the chuck. So uh, anyway, so I have a set of these uh, these these very thin parallels, one thirty second thick. Um, I don't use them very much because uh, they don't provide a lot of, uh, um, you know, a lot of shelf to put your, uh, your part on. And... Uh, um, but they do come in handy for this kind of stuff here. So what I always do is, instead of just trying to put it down on there, I close it on the part, just barely release it so I can push it down, and then I, then I hit the parallels uh, right out of the gate so uh, without screwing around. Okay, so we're going to put... Um, this gets uh, a counter bore and 
two tap tolls, and another counter bore like that. So I just, that's what we're gonna do here. And, um, and once again, we have some, um, some symmetries that we can take advantage of here. We only have two parts, so it's not that big of a deal. Um, but, you know, if, if you're looking for those, those things, then you'll find them. And, uh, and each one of them, uh, you know, saves some time. So we got our stub drills, you know. So here's a couple things. We got stub drills, so we're not, okay. I gotta stop and look at, make sure I'm on the right numbers here. This is the, the hazards of video taping here. Um, yes, yes, okay, my numbers are good. So a couple things, uh, we're not center drilling because we're using a stub drill. That saves a little bit. That saves a tool change and, and uh, a, you know, a series of part swaps because um, we're just gonna, um, um, you know, we're just gonna poke through with this. advantage of that symmetry See, I don't use a lot of oil. It just um, just enough to to keep things moving, and uh, um, your machine doesn't get flooded. And uh, um, so you're just kind of selectively applying it right in the the places that you want it. And you don't need much. And you see, I'm pecking. That just helps with cooling. You know, heat control. I mean, sure, I could drive all the way through there in one whack. You know, but. Uh, um, it's, uh, um, you know, I'm frying my tools, right? Okay, so, we're going to counterbore now. And I put the counterbore all the way up in the chuck like that. Lock it down. And I'm going to set my quill DRO. And, uh, we're going to go low, lower speed. Okay, and um, um, okay, it's quarter inch screw, so we want quarter inch deep plus about ten thousandths um, clearance, or you know, be uh, below flush. So that's two sixty deep. Okay, that's two sixty.
number is uh, 813. Okay. Double check. So these are tap tools here. Yep. Quarter point, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I just realized all that talk about the parallels and stuff and um, the holes off the edge of the vise. I did. I just noticed that. So, anyway, <laughs> didn't didn't need it, but. In this case, with a uh, with a through hole, I'm not going to use this um, uh, this tap. Um, there's no reason to do that. I'm going to use a spiral point tap instead of a spiral flute tap. And what this one does is it pushes the chips ahead, and you'll probably see them coming out the bottom. Um, and it uses less energy than this one does because this is pushing the the stuff up the. Uh, up the flutes this way um, and it's great for blind holes um, these are not as good for blind holes although you can use them uh, you just have to uh, be a little bit careful um, You see, that beats hand tapping uh, any day of the week, right? All right, one last thing. Um, 
we got some burrs that we'll take care of here in a sec. Um, okay, I'm just going to use this to break the edge of those holes.